one of government's steady money spending agencies, the Nigerian Ports Authority, was at the receiving end of the violence that ensued after hoodlums hijacked last October's NSAS protests in Lagos. The agency suffered considerable damage to property as a result of the mayhem, and coming at a time that the Ports Authority was still managing to restore sanity to the confused state of operations at its port complexes in Lagos. That attack has indeed succeeded in highlighting a number of issues. But let's quickly cut to the chase. Here with us to address some of these issues is Adiza Bala Usman, Managing Director of the Nigerian Ports Authority. Adiza Bala Usman, good morning. Good to have you on the program. Good morning. Thank good you morning. for having me. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Well, quickly, let's start with the attack on the MPA uh, properties uh, during the NSAS protests. Uh, I guess you were surprised. But how did that affect your operations? And what steps are you taking uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, you restore the building and, you know, the vehicles that were set ablaze? And um, your general thoughts on the NSAS protests <laughs> and why <laughs> MPA will be a special target? Yes. Um, we had an attack on our corporate headquarters building and also at the Tinkan Island port. A lot of people were not aware that um, Tinkan Island port was indeed attacked by hoodlums and that was for us a more challenging issue because um, having um, an attack into the port locations where you have cargo was something that we could just not um, um, allow. So on Tuesday we had that incident. Um, the <coughs> colleague, commis, Commissioner of Police for the Western Port took lead and prevented the hoodlums from going into Tinkan Island. They had two series of um, attempted attack. Um, through the process, in fact, one of the police officers lost their lives um, within that um, period of attack to Tinkan Island on Tuesday. Um, we, in our minds, prioritized securing the port locations. Um, after that attack on Tinkan Island on Tuesday, we were able to have the military secure uh, port Harcourt, One, Wari, Calabo ports with the mindset that um, these are critical infrastructure that need to be protected and preserved in view of the ongoing um, security challenge in the country. Um, so our headquarters building in Marina was not, to our mind, such a, a flag area, a, a red flag, but we strengthened our mobile police deployment in that place and um, as God would have it, it was the location that was attacked. Um, hoodlums came into the marina headquarters building about 8.45 a.m. on a Wednesday. Um, they set um, the building, um, a wing of our building on fire. Vehicles, about 27 vehicles were burnt. Um, mm, some officers, 27 vehicles were burnt. Um, our security officers were overwhelmed. They took to their heels. Um, we, of course, there was a curfew, so we didn't have um, personnel in the building. We, have a, we had a few IT staff in the premise to, to sustain our IT infrastructure, and one of them got an injury in jumping over the fence, but he's fine and he's been discharged, he's at home. Um, regarding our operations, um, we had a downtime of two days within our um, um, internet service provision for our payments from, um, for two days when the building was attacked, and we're up after 48 hours to continue our operations. So the headquarters building attack was more, I'll say, administrative in terms of our logistical movement for corporate headquarters and um, the offices that were, were touched were our corporate and strategic communications, our public sector uh, media relations were the, the wings that um, got some, um, were, were burnt down and some part of our audit department, um, the windows got burnt but we didn't lose any of our documents, uh, nothing uh, material to our operations were, were affected by, by, by the attack. That's really good to hear because it's quite clear, isn't it, from the general mayhem that we all witnessed mm. that there was no particular motive mm. attached to MPA. Mm. It was just a mass misdirected expression of anger. Yes, in, you could call it ways. that because um, we, you could call it that um, looking at um, the fact that our office is in Marina. You could also look at Echo Disco is right next to us. It wasn't attacked. Quite a number of buildings are on mm. Marina and they mm. were not attacked. So on the one side, we are looking at it that, yes, it's um, random hoodlums that are coming to attack. But on the other side, we also have quite a lot of um, questions around the fact that why your office is a neighboring office right next to you. Why was it not attacked? But for us, um, we are keen to ensure that the investigations, um, seven of the hoodlums were arrested by the military when they came. So um, those seven people are being prosecuted. There's ongoing investigation to determine exactly what it was. We also have CCTV footage of the incident where you see how um, the attack took place. The um, modus operandi, you could see 
um, who was setting the cars on fire, who was breaking the doors, who was... So there's a lot of um, all this information that we've handed over to the security agencies to dig in to see, um, is it random, is it not random? How do we address it going forward? Even if it is random, people should be held accountable for that. Of so course. to the extent that any other such uprising happens in the country, people are mindful about just barging into any office and attacking and looting items. Mm. Rufai? Right. Uh, so I, I just quickly want to talk about uh, rebuilding the infrastructure. A, a, a lot of loss. And I, I must have to say here, sorry about your loss at the MPA. A lot of loss. Uh, what will it take to rebuild the infrastructure and, and what's the work like as regards rebuilding as we speak? Rufai, you're going to take that question again. Let me just go to Dr. Oh, Batty okay. and you repeat that question okay, she later. Didn't, yeah. no. Okay. Okay. No, it, it was asking, what will it take for you to, uh, you know, restructure and address the infrastructural uh, attacks and all okay, of that? Okay, the damage. We... The damage that happened. Okay. You know, and it was, uh, you know, expressing his uh, uh, sympathies. Okay, uh, I didn't hear anything. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, what are you doing to yes, rebuild? Yes, we are. We are um, <clears throat> all our property are fully insured. So we've had um, called on to our insurers. Um, the building, the part, the wing that was... Um, um, touched, we're doing integrity tests to determine the level of um, repairs that are needed. Our vehicles are also all fully insured, so we are going through the process of reclaiming our, our in, uh, insurance claim um, to that extent. So um, our, our personnel that sit in the place that is burnt, we're leasing uh, a wing in one of the buildings on the marina so that they can work there pending when um, the building is rehabilitated and, and put back. So we also had a lot of lootings of computers, printers, and photocopiers. We're also going to the process of insurance claim and also replacing them so that we can, you know, get on with what we need to do. Well, let me ask you about COVID. This is the year, this is the year of uh, COVID-19, uh, the year 2020, the year some people say they would rather forget. Uh, but how has that affected your operations, particularly in terms of revenue? Uh, the ports were not shut down. Yes. But, of course, there was disruption mm -hmm. uh, of uh, demand and supply, the global supply chain, yes. chain. And that affected shipping, the maritime industry, and all that. Mm -hmm. How did that directly <laughs> affect, you know, uh, your agency in terms of operations and revenue? Yes. As you mentioned, um, globally, the port operations were sustained. Um, IMO, International Maritime Organization, has a strong position regarding having um, sustained um, shipping and, and port activities, so we remained open. Um, as you mentioned, the challenge was to do with the full value chain for port operations. So while the ports are functional, cargo comes into the port, but the warehouses were shut down. Um, truck drivers were, 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 were not at work during the full lockdown. So even if your cargo comes into the port, you can't evacuate it and take it to you. So that was an issue because it doesn't work in, ports can't work in isolation of the full value chain um, of the economy. But for us is ensuring that the cargo comes in. And when the cargo did arrive and a lot of cargo were stuck in the port because people couldn't actually take their goods out. So Nigerian Ports Authority gave a waiver for a um, rent-free period, um, during the period where there was a full national lockdown, every cargo that came in, um, consignees were given a free hand. You would need not pay for rent for keeping your cargo in the ports because it's not your fault that you're unable to, to get your, your cargo out. So to that extent, we had a government took on that um, revenue, uh, I'll say, um, gave off that revenue to ensure that um, consignees feel a bit of cushion regarding their inability to take their cargo out. And... Um, while the, we have the challenges within the economy for um, um, COVID and revenue generation, um, for us in Nigerian ports within the period January to October, we've been able to raise 291 billion naira um, as revenue that has been realized. And in 2019, um, we raised 298 billion January to December. Um, so you can see that the differential is marginal. Um, and for November, December, we may be able to meet up to what we raised in 2019, and we may not. But January to October, 291 billion thus far. January to December 2019, 298 billion. So um, there has been a reduction, but um, it's not huge in terms of volumes. You can see from the um, amount of revenue that we've realized within the period. Which leads to my next question, still on the root shock that was the COVID-19 pandemic and how it devastated oil prices. Mm -hmm. Is this now the time for the blue economy?
to step up. You've just said you've really managed to withstand that rude shock. What should be done now in terms of institutional framework, legal framework, to really boost the maritime industry? And especially in light of the government's policies, which are sort of aiming at reducing importation. Where do you stand in all of that? Um, it's key. The blue economy is huge, and I think we should... Um, walk in every way to tap into it and um, I believe it should be one of our key revenue um, areas that needs to be tapped considering what's happening with oil and gas. There are certain areas that we need to improve upon. Um, in Nigerian ports we're keen to have um, deeper um, deep sea ports that have deeper drafts that will enable bigger vessels come into the country. Right now we have 30 meter draft vessels called into and John Ports, um, global depth are 16 to 70 meters. So we're looking to see how we can have the lucky deep sea port come on board um, to enable us to um, have deeper um, um, ports. Um, one of the things that we also are concerned about is the turnaround time of vessels and also the inspection period. So when you bring in your cargo, how effective are the inspection agencies, the clearing process? Um, do we, we need to ensure that we do not do um, physical examination? So when you see... Um, X um, 1.3 million TEUs of containers come into Nigeria and all those cargo are inspected physically, then you know, I mean, that's going to take a long ages. time. It takes ages. Um, Nigerian Customs is working to deploy the scanners to enable um, those clearing processes be done efficiently so you don't have to sit and open every container that comes in to, to check what's, what's in it. And also... Um, other areas that are very important are to do with dry docking of vessels. This is, of course, outside of our direct mandate at Nigerian ports, but it's a huge revenue earner. When you look at all the vessels that call into Nigeria, and we mandate those vessels to, serve, to be serviced in-country, so that in itself is a huge... On our part, we have given discounts for how about you for any vessel that is moving for um, dry docking. Dry docking is servicing of vessels. So all vessels that call into Nigeria for oil and gas... Um, work for anything are required to service in Nigeria. Right now, they usually go to Ghana, they go to Senegal to, re to, to service their vessels because we do not have um, dry docking facilities that are in of international standards. And that, for me, is one of the huge, I mean, untapped area that we need to focus on. Um, of course, as government, we need to provide the legal regulatory environment to do that, which is what we've done on our part. I remember an incident where um, we, we, after giving that discount, the, this company usually takes their vessels to Ghana, and the, the Ghanaian company sent him an invoice, and he said, I'm not going to Ghana this time, I'm servicing in Nigeria, because it's now Fantastic. cheaper, Nigerian Ports has given us a discount, so I'm doing it here. If you can, you know, allow, let me bring in my vessel for zero cost, based on what the MPA has given me, I'll take it to Ghana, and they couldn't. So we've done our part, and... When you encourage like private sector to develop these dockyards, encourage the other agencies of government that are in this sector to see what we can do to, to, to open up and ensure that um, we have more within the blue economy. And what's more important is the legal and regulatory environment, compliance to contractual obligations, ensuring federal government, um, the interests of the citizens are prioritized um, when it comes to any such um, contractual relationships. Great. Rufai? Rufai. Talk about uh, access roads to the ports, Tinkham ports uh, and uh, Lagos port complex. And I also want to talk about future plans for other ports in the country, uh, Eastern ports and the likes. Uh, what, what is the MPA thinking as regards all of those issues? Okay, on access roads um, into the port, the one side is there is an ongoing construction by the Federal Ministry of Work on rehabilitating the roads. Um, but what is more integral to the discussion is the congestion around the ports. And um, I believe we all have the understanding that intermodal transportation system is key to addressing the congestion on the one side. By intermodal, I mean they need to have rail, um, inland waterways as um, um, routes for cargo evacuation. Globally, you cannot have a port where, well, say, 90% of the cargo is evacuated by road. So when you look at the volumes of the cargo, the tonnage of the cargo, and you imagine all of that is going by road, in your mind, you should realize there will be congestion. In your mind, you should know that those, those roads would remain bad because of the weight of all that tonnage. So right now, the Ministry of Transportation, through Nigerian Railway Corporation, is embarking on this huge rail deployment. And one of the priority areas are Lagos spots. Tinkan Island and Apapa are going to have um, rail tracks going into them right to the key sides of the terminals. Um, of course, historically, we had marginal rail connection to the ports, but that is being revamped and um, completely rehabilitated. 
On the other side also, inland waterways need to be used for cargo evacuation. Um, we've had an incident where we've been able to move cargo from One to Onicha, which is an inland um, water port, and that is um, very important because we need to be able to use those inland water routes. There, of course, is an agency, Nigerian Inland Water Authorities, that is responsible for that, but we partner with them to see how we can strengthen that. But um, on the um, issue of also having truck packs, these are the areas where Nigerian Ports Authority has been keen to deploy an e collop system for trucks calling into the ports and having designated truck packs where the e collops are, are linked to the port locations. Um, we've um, reached an advanced stage with Lagos State Government on concluding the deployment of the e collop which would be unveiled in January, um, so that um, truck owners and truck users can only access the port through the e collop system. Um, so if you don't have that electronic call-up system that is sent to you, you have no business being on the road to the port location. So, and I think that would, in uh, a lot of ways, address the huge um, rent-seeking that goes on in that era. You would hear people are paying uh, 1.5 million for uh, um, X food container to, to Abuja and how it costs so much to move the cargo. There's a lot of rent seeking around that corridor where security officials and all manners of um, on, I'll say, um, all manners of payments are being made for trucks to access the port. So this e collop system would go a long way in addressing that rent seeking and also providing a sanity in that area where a truck only comes onto the road when it has that electronic call-up. You have no business being on the road if you have not been called upon based on the readiness of the terminal to either receive a cargo you're dropping off or pick the cargo you're picking up. Well, uh, Eastern ports, too. yes, we can quickly speak okay. about yes. Eastern ports. Is yes. that um, we're giving discounts on harbor dues for calling into um, Calabar ports and rivers ports to encourage vessel owners to call in that location. But we've also strengthened our honor port to receive container terminals, container cargo. There's what the um, the largest container vessel that has ever called into Nigeria actually called into honor ports um, during the year um, to signify the readiness of honor port to receive large container vessels. So we are giving all the necessary infrastructure and support to enable um, ONE become a con container hub to reduce the congestion around um, the Lagos area and also have more um, inflow of cargo. But it's important to understand that for every location that you use to determine where your cargo comes, there's a linkage. So if my cargo goes to ONE, how easy is it for my cargo to move from ONE to ONICHA? The road linking on it, on it, is it navigable? The road linking on it to the northern part of the country, to all these locations. So that's also important. That interconnection between the port to the final destination of the cargo is key. We have, of course, been um, notifying the Federal Ministry of Works and the respective agencies that have to do with those linkages to prioritize rehabilitating the roads. So if um, the road connecting on airport to hinterland or to Aba and Onicha is not navigable with articulated trucks, then it becomes a problem. Because if I get my cargo there, I need for my cargo to get to its final destination as quick as possible. So in some instance, people bring their cargo to Lagos because there's clarity on the route. Oh, my truck, it will go in this way and it will get to Aba, or it will go in this way and you get to Kaduna. So these are some of the things that um, we need to look at. But on our side, we're pushing to see that um, the eastern ports get... Um, the priority consideration for um, improved infrastructure and discount on, on harbor dues? Well, I mean, when you assumed office, I guess in 2016, yes. you promised that you were going to transform the Nigerian Ports Authority. Yes. From your response to uh, Tundun's question about mm. the blue economy mm. and some of the other things you said, mm. you've outlined some of the things you've been able to do. Yes. Uh, what are the challenges? That you have faced along the line, or it's just been a it's no, smooth it hasn't, ride. Absolutely, absolutely. It's and then smooth you take all. along with that. Somebody <laughs> sent me a, a text message. Yes. Uh, this is in response to your statement about dry docking. Yes. He says Niger Dock was fully equipped for dry docking. What happened to Niger Dock? <laughs> Niger Dock still exists. It's privately owned. It's being run by a company, a private company. And um, we are available to provide them with every necessary support. Niger Dock is not owned by the government. As he would recall, there was privatization and uh, a company took over. So it does exist and um, um, that is that. On the issue of um, the challenges, of course there are huge challenges. There are a lot of pushbacks that we receive. And one of the important things is the... Um, our key performance indicators as Nigerian ports cannot be achieved without other agencies um, working. It's like a full system. So in the minds of an average Nigerian, if his cargo comes to the port 
and it is in the ports, they call Hadiza. Oh, my cargo is in the port and it's stuck there. I can't get it out. But what they fail to realize is that once the cargo gets into the port and is offloaded out of the vessel onto the terminal, the agencies responsible for inspection take over. So at that point, it's not within the jurisdiction of Nigerian ports. So in your mind, how long it takes your cargo to get to your warehouse is the efficiency of the ports. So in doing that, we have to look at the value chain and assign responsibility. So to the extent that, for example, we don't have scanners in the ports, that delays clearance. We do not have um, uh, truck packs to, to enable um, um, seamless um, inflow and outflow. That is also Nigerian ports. But we don't deploy scanners. It's Nigerian customs. They lead on that. We don't inspect the cargo. That, that's not part of what we need to do. So our job is to ensure that um, the vessels come in into the fairway buoy, which is the entrance of um, Nigerian waterways. Our pilots bring in the vessels, they come to the berth, they offload onto the terminals efficiently. So we need to ensure the channels are deep, um, they're within the required draft as advertised, and also the cons um, concessionaires, do they have the necessary equipment based on the development plan to quickly offload and the vessel leaves. And when they offload, at that point, someone else takes over. So those clearing procedures where we don't have a single windows, which is an electronic platform that reduces rent seeking, allows um, agencies of government that are part of the inspection to do it without physically being there are absent. So we have to keep knocking on the door of customs, please um, deploy scanners, knocking on the door of Ministry of Works, please ensure that um, the roads are, are rehabilitated, knocking on railway, please deploy rail to the cargo. So that in itself makes our key performance indicators tied to other people's obligations. Um, the other side is, of course, the pushback has to do with um, corruption fights back when you're instituting reforms that seeks to prioritize um, government interests, seeks to um, recognize that the citizens and Nigeria as a country is priority over a private company that has signed some agreements that are not in compliance with um, regulatory obligations. That is also a huge pushback um, that I've received. Yes, because you just mentioned the word compliance really yes. lightly, but we all yes. know there's a lot that goes into trying to enforce compliance. Yes. Would you be referring to OMSL, Intel, yes. all of those challenges that you've had? <laughs> Would you like to take us through that? What were the issues? Because there was there were a lot of back and forth yes. in the press. Yes, there's, there's quite a lot of back and forth. Um, on OMSL is the secure anchorage um, area where vessels are made to pay um, for be for anchoring and being secured within the Nigerian ports. Um, this started in 2013 um, to, to provide that platform with a partnership with Nigerian Navy. And fast forward in 2017, we felt that it was necessary for people to be paying money just to secure their vessels when they're anchoring in Nigerian waters. It is the responsibility of government through Navy and NIMASA um, to secure it as zero cost to vessel owners. Um, um, just to speak to January to July, um, OMSL got $17, 17 million dollars in revenues for securing vessels. And none of those revenues come to the coffers of the federal government. But what is more imperative is if you feel you are um, you're trying to improve ease of doing business in your country, reduce the cost of doing business, and you are charging vessel owners X dollars for anchoring their vessels, I, I think that's not... Uh, um, that's not uh, an activity that is in the interest of Nigeria and Nigerian citizens because for every dollar you pay to secure cargo, the consignee will transfer it to you, the final final user of, of that cargo. So that's the one hand. And we have directed the cancelling of the secure anchorage. There are um, ongoing um, activities within secure anchorage. We're having um, discussions with the, uh, um, with the vice president on concluding that we had given directives for them to dismantle because it completely beats my mind how you can justify that activity. So, so, so that's, that, that's a pushback. <laughs> On Intel's, so we have, uh, of course, our layers of relationship. Um, the <laughs> non-compliance to TSA, they realized they had to comply. After a lot of pushback, they complied. Um, now their contractual relationship with us on service boat has expired. And following the expiration, they've gone to court to request for them to remain as the uh, third party provider, which is ridiculous. You know, you can't force government to provide a service. We, of course, have another relationship with them to do with an amortization project that we have, which revenues arising from service boat is made to pay for the amortization. But the point is that Intel's need not be the service provider for that service to enable government repay them for the amortization. There's nowhere in the contractual relationship. But of course, they've gone to court, and we're also challenging it um, vigorously to ensure that um, 
um, Nigerian government gets um, value for money and also um, um, Nigerian government's contractual obligations are met up. Nigeria would always meet up with its own obligations, but based on what is an agreement. You can't rewrite an agreement or you think you, you can bully people into uh, um, complying to some, some ridiculous position that you, you feel is what is in your best interest as opposed to what is in the best interest of the country. Rufai. I just want to talk and, and uh, double click again on the e call up system because it's really very important. I mean, uh, we, we have this long uh, talk about, yeah, it's a great idea, but the workability of the idea, uh, Creek Road is always bonkers as regards traffic, no go area. Uh, a lot of people are saying security men are, are fleecing people, are making a lot of money. I mean, what will be the, the workability of this e up system? Because it looks as though it's not, it's not getting the desired effect. And a lot of people are complaining about the quagmire now. Well, the e up hasn't started. So it couldn't, you know, it hasn't started yet. Uh, if, if Rufai had listened, it's a start in January. So um, it's not in effect now to determine um, how it's functioned or not. Um, but what it is, is that the... Um, e collop would um, remove such human interventions. So the policeman on the road cannot determine whether you're gaining access into the pot. It is that collop system that will determine it is to do with compliance and also to have locations where um, those trucks sit. So in a lot of instances, um, trucks are driving through the pot locations randomly um, without having any clear or oh, um, dropping of this cargo based on this document. So Trucks just wake up literally and drive to the port. So in this instance, we're going to have designated truck parks where you sit in these truck parks. And the only reason why you're on the road is if you are part of, you're being called upon to go. So however it may be, if you are, you don't have cargo to, to drop off, you are waiting in a truck park. If you don't have cargo to pick up, you're waiting in the truck park. And to the extent that the cargo that have come in, the cargo also remain in the port until that linkage is established. So this is what we, um, we seek to do. And... Um, electronic call-up is uh, an integral part of what would facilitate removing and reducing that huge rent-seeking that exists in that, um, that environment. And also, when you, when you don't have a place that you tell someone to sit, he'll sit anywhere. I mean, it's, it's logic. If you don't so designate, this is a place where all trucks need to pack. These are one, two, three, four locations, and you have to be in there. But didn't we have that in the past, and it was hijacked, and it didn't work? What is the guarantee? Like well, I've been here for around. four years. There's never been an e call up system for truck packs. Well, not e call up, <laughs> a parking bay. No, the parking bay, there's no, we, we have no parking bays in that way existed. Um, Nigerian Ports gave Lily Pond off as a transit pack. Right now, there are small truck packs that exist that are not part of any e call up. So, for example, you can have a truck pack location that can host 50 trucks and you come and say, oh, I can do that. And you're part of a manual call-up system. And that manual call-up system has Nigerian ports part of it, presidential tax force, Nigerian police force, last month physically doing all of that. So you can see, um, I would never um, say that our own staff are not part of that um, system. So Nigerian ports security staff, Nigerian ports um, marine operations staff, they're all part of this manual system. So that manual system allows you as an individual, a member of Nigerian Ports Authority or the task force to say, oh, these 10 trucks will go into the ports today. Meanwhile, if there's an e up that you cannot interfere with, you can now personally decide and personally be giving gratification for facilitating the movement of those 10 trucks because it doesn't sit with you as an individual and doesn't, you don't have that, physical, that access into the e up to interfere in the um, call-up of, of, of the trucks. Well, I was going to ask you what your plans, your future plans for the ports are. Yeah. Well, you've talked about e up I yes. guess that's part of the future. Yes. But what are the other plans that you have? Hmm. And then, I mean, this interview, I see you are very popular. <laughs> and many of our viewers, they are planning to take over. I think it's the port, <laughs> it's the port activity <laughs> consignment coming so to the port. This person sent in a question. He says, ask her. You know, it's an instruction. Yes, it's directive. Command. Yes. <laughs> She came to the job with very little or no experience in corporate management. In fact, her last assignment was in Bring Back Our Girls NGO. How did she overcome the learning curve? <laughs> well, so I guess you can just address this. No, he uh, may, it would be good to check my profile on, the, on our website. I've, I've actually worked before for quite a long time, yes. <laughs> I was I chief of staff to Kaduna State Governor. I worked at Bureau for Public Enterprise. 
um, BPE, which is responsible for privatization. I worked there for years and then I worked at the FC. So I do have experience in terms of management. But what's important is um, coming into a new job is to read and understand and um, be very dedicated um, to your work and, and, and read, read and understand. Um, don't um, just think it's, it's an easy um, PZ, just, oh, a managing director and all the perks that come with it overwhelm you and you don't really focus on, on understanding the, the, the industry, understanding the legal and regulatory environment and um, understanding um, the issue of um, compliance and obligations across um, relationships. So um, it's putting your head down and, and, and rolling your sleeves and really um, getting into, into the work. Yeah, about the future plans I talked about. Future plan. Oh, yeah. The um, key, key to Nigerian ports, as I mentioned earlier, is the need to have deep sea ports. Um, we are losing larger vessels calling in our ports. Um, we're becoming a transshipment hub because larger vessels will call in neighboring ports and small vessels will bring cargo to Nigeria because we only have 13 meters. So we are working as fast as we can with the developers of Lekki and um, there is an e-bomb deep sea port to enable us have those um, deeper drafts that are needed um, for big vessels. And with that would come with the improved operational efficiency of the terminal, improved cranes, um, better equipment, the yard would um, um, be better. We're also keen to have um, scanners deployed on the ports. And this is really important for cargo clearance. That would mean a um, um, uh, truck would just pass through the scanner and then that's it. You're not sitting and opening a truck. So customs deploy their scanners across port locations, having a, a, a single windows electronic system within our ports, um, that's very important. The other leg to the concern about um, um, port operations is to do with the issue of piracy in the Gulf of Guinea. So enhanced security within the maritime waterways is so important um, because some of the challenges or reasons why consignees um, don't, are not keen to take their cargo to the eastern ports is the issue of um, insecurity in that area. Um, so currently there is a, a project that NIMASA is driving around um, security of the waterways and that is important. So security of the Gulf of Guinea, um, deploying scanners and electronic system for, for um, scanning um, items, deeper drafts for um, deep sea ports, that is um, the, the future and that would be um, the game changer for the Nigerian um, port systems where you have um, those three legs of, of activities being enhanced. Well, the more automated and digitalized, the better. Yes. Do I have time for a question? Yes, please. Yes. So I wanted to ask you how you're going to fund the deeper drafts. Where's the funding coming from? It's actually private sector driven. Oh, great. Yeah, so government just provides an uh, enabling environment, legal and regulatory um, 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 provision, and also marine services. So following the concession, Nigerian Ports does not get involved in actual operations, but compliance and marine services. So it's really private sector driven. Rufai, any question? Ask you, how has, how has been the you know, inter-agency relationship been like, and management of that relationship, and the hurdles you've scaled, and some of the challenges you've had as regards you know, you know, talking to other ancillary agencies still in the maritime sector for the betterment of the sector? Um, we've had a very, um, I would say, seamless relationship um, with our sister agencies. There are challenges when it comes to our jurisdictional issues. We have, for example, um, concerns around um, Nigerian Inland Waterways and Nigerian Ports Authority, um, which terminals or which um, jetties are under whose purview. So there are some of these overlaps that are existing within our legal and regulatory um, frameworks of the agencies, but we sit together to ensure that those overlaps do not cause any, any challenge. Um, we recently in, introduced a monthly meeting where all the heads of agencies in the maritime industry meet every month to discuss any issue and have one position. So that has really helped us in synergizing. And as I mentioned earlier, um, linkages with other agencies of government are key to ensuring your key performance indicators are met. So having that um, relationship is important. Um, just to quickly speak to the issue of overtime cargo. Um, when cargo come into the port and they remain into the, inside the terminal, for a long time, there's a period where it becomes overtime cargo. So they need to be moved out, taken to government warehouse, and customs needs to auction them. So right now, we're having a problem with um, the government warehouse is full. So customs needs to auction those cargo, and then we can move out more of the overtime cargo. That way, there's more space in the terminal for cargo that come in. So it's really literally us calling each other. I will call the CG customs that we need to get this done. And um, these priority considerations will be given because of um, 
um, interagency relationship and collaboration. And I think it's important for us that are in government um, to relate and ensure that citizens get value for money, citizens get the service. It's not the citizens' business, whether customs and Nigerian ports or inland waterways. No, we need to ensure that we work together to provide that results that Nigerian citizens want. Well, this is uh, turning out to be a very interactive uh, session <laughs> with your, you know, stakeholders. Yes. Um, I have quite a number of questions here sent in via Twitter. Okay, let's see. Let me check. Okay, this gentleman says, good morning, sir. Please ask the MPA boss about the container scanners that stopped working. That's one. Let me take just about three. <laughs> Two, how will they prevent the truck holding base mm -hmm. from turning into a mechanic yard? <laughs> and abandoned trucks. And three, good morning, sir. Please ask the distinguished MPA boss, is government truly going to reduce duty on vehicle importation? And where will it start? I don't know whether that's your own... Uh, yes, the, details, the uh, income, the duty on... The, it's part of the finance bill yeah, that the president yes. has signed and is sending back to the National Assembly. So that, um, that is that. Um, on the issue of the truck parks being, there would be a maintenance um, agreement. There would be regulations on compliance with the truck parks so they're not turned into any um, junkyard or a mechanic yard, as it were. So for every truck park that is uploaded onto the um, um, call-up system, there are standards that you need to maintain to remain in the call-up um, system. So for every... So you can imagine if you have a truck park and then only trucks that come from one, two, three, four, five truck parks would access the port. So, I mean, that's, that's money. So you know that you must adhere to, to the standards uh, of the port locations. The first question was, I lost was, it. Was uh, container scanners that stopped work? Oh, yes. I, I think I've spoken about scanners. These are under the jurisdiction of Nigerian Customs Service. But just to say that um, they have gotten approval, they're in the process of procuring and deploying the scanners. Uh, the scanners are important to us. It would really facilitate um, ease of um, scanning and um, clearance of cargo. Because if you open, you, you have to physically open all those containers, you would know that um, it, things will be delayed. Because uh, um, those that are familiar, they come and position the containers, the customs lead agency comes, they open the container, they start searching, and I mean, that's not efficient. Okay, I was going to ask you a politics-related question. <laughs> and this is, I, I guess you could use this opportunity to respond to a story that appeared in uh, mm. the Sahara Reporters okay. about a few days ago, okay. uh, November 27, to be precise, yes. in which uh, you were accused of having collecting, collected some <laughs> money from uh, Alaji Aliku Dangote. Yes, I saw that. During the elections. 2015. And that uh, the monies went into your account. <laughs> <laughs> and that you were one of those, you know, uh, collecting money to fund the election. That's what I read, too. And that, that was uh, how you rose to uh, prominence <laughs> within the APC. Yes. Do, do you want to use this opportunity to respond yes, to Yes, they had contacted me, and I said I'm not aware of that, um, that, that those, those payments. I um, plan to get my account details from Access Bank to see what it is that, that happened in, in that regard. And I'll also speak to um, the fact that people may not be familiar that I contested elections in 2011 under the Congress for Progressive Change, um, which was one of the parties that formed um, the All Progressives Congress. So I was in politics from 2010. I contested in 2011. I was um, um, part of the team that worked on the renewal of CPC. The renewal of Congress for Pro Progressive Change is what brought up the need for the merger in which case the CPC, as led by President Buhari then, agreed to merge with um, ACN and the other parties. So I have been part of politics from 2010. So to think that 2015 being a conduit pipe is what um, brought about my uh, ascension to politics is, is, is completely ridiculous. And also to remind people that whatever the case is, 2015 as a private citizen, I was not working in government to, 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 to that extent. So um, I reserve the right to, to do what it is that I may do. But to that extent, I, I don't remember any such payments being made. And as I said to them, that I'll verify on my account details. But just to speak to the fact that I have been part of a political movement for quite a while. So that is, that, that's a non-issue on my, my, my ascension to, to, to a political position.
Well, with a, woman's, right. with a woman's ascension, it's always about everything but her competence. Absolutely, isn't it? absolutely. <laughs> well, Thank you, my sister. Unfortunately, we've become well, so, accustomed yes. to that. Someone didn't even remember that you, you had a career. Yes, they never big, do. Bring back our yes. girls. They, they, they never think do. You are, all about you is bring back our yes, girls. Yes, yes, yes. For so us women, it's so challenging time. that yeah, nobody wants to believe, um, look at your capability or the fact that you have value to add. They first think you're a woman. You couldn't have gotten here. It's tokenism. You you have no 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 capacity at all. So thank you, my sis, for bringing I mean, that up. <laughs> That's what we have to deal with every day. Yeah, constant. I know. It's constant. But Microaggression. We'll, Nigeria will evolve. We'll become Amen. more gender friendly. God willing. Yes. Gender <laughs> sensitive. Yes. Rufai, now, you were saying something. I, I haven't asked my okay, question, Rufai. Okay, okay. I was showing solidarity. Yes. That's right. Great. That's, a, Great. that's my question. The cost of governance is yes. such an issue, and yes. we all look to the presidency, to the executive. But what about you, MPA, mm -hmm. as an income-generating agency of government? What are you doing to reduce just the burden of overhead? Yes. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. Um, I've cut off so many things, you know. There are little, little payments that are made that all add up to um, increase in, in cost of governance. And some of these things, you don't even realize you're approving. One, two, three, and it builds up. So um, one of the things that we've done is to reduce travel. So travel is a huge thing in, in public sector, I'm sure you'd know. So I've said, you know, you need to do this, have a Zoom meeting, do it online, because we operate, we have six port locations. So our staff are quick to say, we need to go to all ports to do this, but not minding that you don't need to physically go. So these are some of the areas that um, I've worked to reduce um, cost of um, governance. Travel is one thing. You also have um, areas of um, unnecessary overheads of um, other agencies, um, National Assembly. So there are all these little things that all add up. So we're, we're keen to reduce that. And more so now, COVID has shown that um, you can do a lot of things virtually. And that, for me, is, is big. So a lot of our workshops, our conferences, and all of that, um, we've encouraged for them to be done as webinars, for them to... Um, not to have that physical interface. And physical interface really costs a lot of money. And we've also um, learned to have um, vehicles being used as pool vehicles as opposed to having vehicles assigned to offices and officers. So when you need to go on an official assignment, you book and the car will be made available to you, but for, not for it to be assigned to you, which would mean um, the organization would have a higher number of vehicles because everybody has a vehicle assigned to, to themselves. So these are um, the areas we've done also stationary, you know, printing, trying to do more um, e-communication um, and e-deployment as much as possible, even though government likes to sign and approve physically. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Rufai, Rufai, over to you now. All right, thank you so much for that. And uh, I'm with you on that solidarity, Tundu. All right. Uh, I, I just quickly want to talk about local content, which is really very important and pertinent to me, because I feel for the country to develop, there must be a great sense of local content. Uh, I, I, I understand MPA has a unit for local content. What has been done as regards that? Uh, can we come to MPA today and see that most of your documentation and logistical software are made even in Nigeria by Nigeria coders and developers? You know, just to be able to deepen this uh, conversation about local content. Absolutely. There is an executive order on local content. Uh, some people are not aware of it. And typical of government, um, sometimes we always... Um, hide some of these things that um, people so I've always encouraged contractors to look at that executive order and local content and when you're submitting a bid to agencies of government refer to that executive order which seeks to prioritize local content so for every tender there's a need to have local content and government has done the executive order so I call on to contractors that bid for government projects to to use that um, executive order to, to bring to call us um, um, to the table around that we are conscious about, for example, the e up system that we're deploying is wholly Nigerian. Is, um, the, the whole concept, the whole um, software was developed, designed by Nigerians and for Nigeria. So that was one of the attractions that we had for it. But also, there are certain software that we need that are beyond what has been developed in Nigeria. And while we encourage for us to, to use um, local content for ICT, there are certain things that we need that we... Um, our developers have not um, gotten there yet. But um, personally, I'm keen to encourage um, younger people that have initiatives for us to improve on our local content, and, that, and, and that's key. So for everything we do, we um, beyond the executive order, um, I personally try to 
encourage um, people to, to bring in solutions or bring in ideas that are local. And as I say, some of our problems are local and solutions um, would be local because of the understanding um, of the terrain. So local content is indeed um, important for stimulating our economy. Well, earlier on, I think it was Tundun that asked you a question about Intel's. Yes. Some of the controversies you were dealing with. Well, yes. I, I'm not too sure. I was so pleased with that. You know, there's Intel's. Yes. You also have issues, I think, with Bois. Yes. I think there was a time we had Captain Usa Okumbo here. Yes. And there's also an issue with uh, something marine uh, company that he, I, I have yeah. spoken about that actually. You that have? is the secure that's anchorage the area. Oh, that's the secure yes. anchorage. Yes. Okay, but yesterday, yes, a high court yes. sitting in uh, Portaco River mm. State mm. Uh, gave a restraining order mm. against uh, the Port Authority mm. from taking over bets nine, ten, and eleven mm. from Intel's. Mm. Are you aware of that? That's Later actually, you know, you know, it's, it's quite interesting that that was not the court didn't give a restraining order. I didn't extend the restraining order, but it was Intel's own way of trying to notify the public. What happened in court, and our lawyers sent an official submission um, on it, is that um, they adjourned the case to the 7th of December and said that um, status quo should be maintained. Um, nobody should, for, for, for them to have the um, hearing on 7th, everybody should just maintain status quo, not extending the restraining order. So that wasn't what was done. And those that are familiar with the legal process, you cannot have a restraining order for one month. It's not, it's not legally possible. But Intel has gone to the media and say, oh, they've extended a restraining order. But Nigerian Post just didn't feel the need to now say, oh, it's not a restraining order. Let's just go through um, with, with, with the court case. Um, there's a hearing on the 7th of December, which we, which we would go ahead with. Um, um, Intel's are challenging Nigerian Ports' um, utilization of both 9, 10, and 11. Um, that, is, uh, that is what it is. And we're, we're, we're as I said, aggressively um, pursuing our, our rights as government to assign a birth as we see fit. Intel's cannot determine what we do as a country. Intel is not an Nigerian post authority. And what the government chooses to do is what the government will do in line with the legal and regulatory framework. We never go outside of the um, legal framework to assign births or to, um, for, for services to end. Um, so we, we would pursue this aggressively, as I said. Yeah, I get your point about the legal and regulatory framework. Yes. But you know, with uh, Intel's mm. and MPA, mm. uh, there's this perception mm. that this is a case of a political <laughs> witch hunting. Yes. Do you want to comment I on do. That? I always speak to that. So if um, I always see, don't see how what is political about a company not complying with TSA. So if government says I have treasury single account from 2015, all revenues of government should go into the treasury single account. And a private company says, oh, by the way, I am not complying. And then government says you must comply. So what is political about that? In fact, who is being political? Is it you, Intel's, that has hitherto always had political advantage that way you never comply to government directives? So can we look at it in that way? So I'm curious as to what is political about the fact that your contract has ended? And Nigerian Post Authority is reclaiming back its service. So how is it political that governments, your contract ended in August, August 9th, and government says, oh, now that your contract has ended, thank you very much for the service you've rendered. Government will continue that service and pay that your sister company for any revenues arising from that. And you say, no, I must be the service provider. So what is political about that? For me, what is even political is the fact that a company thinks it's above the law because he that too, it has been using its own political influence to operate outside of the legal framework. So we should actually be questioning Intel why they have always been political about their operations. Can't you operate in a, an environment in line with the legal frameworks that that government has provided? And let's also remember that um, the current administration did not introduce Treasury single account was inherited from the last government and yet that particular company refuses to comply so if we tell everybody has complied and you refuse to comply because you think you're above the law so nobody is above the law and as it relates to birth 9 10 and 11 no this is the birth owned by government government says no you you can't operate that birth anymore so why do you think you force government to do that
So, you know, these are some of the things that I always find curious when the political line is thrown around Intel. I always say it's actually Intel that has been political because it's always used its political advantage to operate outside of the legal frameworks. That is what it's been doing. So for now, that government has said, oh, hold on, everybody must operate in the same way. There's a level playing field for every operator. You're not above the law. Then suddenly they're crying wolf that, oh, it's non-political, it's non-political, without realizing that what's political about you complying to TSA? What's political about you? A contract has ended, government says, oh, we're going to do this ourselves. We're going to initiate a procurement process to um, um, change um, um, the company. Yours has ended. And it's quite interesting, you know, with, with the service boat is that your contract was ending. Government initiated a procurement process to replace the company. And Intel's bid... Intel's didn't qualify, and Intel's went to court. You know, some of these things are laughable when you when you are recounting them because the I'll say the the the, the audacity of a company to think it can operate outside of the laws is baffling, and to use politicization as a justification for their action is even more baffling. Well. Clear enough. Thank well, you. Well, I hope people understand that English <laughs> because every time we speak to it, we still come back to it that, oh, it's political. And every time I explain it, it's like people are like, oh, surprised at that. So please, people should answer what is political about these things that I've listed. Well, the matter is in court. <laughs> Let the uh, court decide yes. eventually. Thank you very much, Adisa Balausman, for joining us on The Morning Show.